Hello, everyone. We're uh, going to get started in just a minute or two. Let the uh, uh, people continue to file in. But we'll be get going here in just about a minute. So stick tight. We'll be right back. Hello again, everyone. <clears throat> you know, Earth Day is coming up on Saturday, and I just wanted to wish everyone a happy Earth Day a little bit early. I know you're uh, all doing wonderful things for the planet. I hope you're able to get outside, do something good, or, uh, you know, a lot of you are already doing good things, so maybe just one extra thing. But just wanted to take that moment while we were here imminently close to Earth Day. Hey, we've got a highly anticipated webinar today, and judging by all the people who pre-registered and who are still filing in. We're going to talk about buried ducks and high-performance vented attics, and we're going to do that thanks to the support of NEMA. Now, the 2018 IECC laid out a prescriptive approach for using buried ducks with fibrous insulation in vented attics for all climate zones. Now, this new path will allow builders to get much of the energy efficiency benefits of an unvented attic with closed uh, cell spray foam by instead doing a traditional vented attic with the ducks buried in fibrous insulation. Some of the research used to support this code change was performed by our guest today, Dave Millay. Now he's going to explain the research that led to the code change, the benefits of this design approach, and he's going to walk us through how to comply with the new code language. So let's learn more about Dave. He's a research engineer at Home Innovation Research Labs. He provides engineering support for Home Innovation's Applied Engineering Group and Building Science Research Program, where he focuses on residential building enclosures and mechanical systems. He also participates as a project engineer in DOE's Building America program. Dave's projects focus on system performance, optimization, risk mitigation, and code compliance. They involve participation from multiple stakeholders, including federal agencies, builders, manufacturers, associations, and regulators. And they range from concept development all the way to field testing and monitoring. He has extensive experience with HVAC design and quality assurance. And prior to joining Home Innovation in 2008, he worked in the residential and light commercial mechanical contracting industry for 12 years and in the industrial equipment industry for four years. He holds a BS in mechanical engineering from Penn State University. Now, I used the acronym NEMA before, and I wanted to explain what that stood for in case we have any guests that don't know. North American Insulation Manufacturers Association, or NEMA, is the recognized voice of the insulation industry, bringing together North American manufacturers of fiberglass and mineral wool insulation products. Through the Insulation Institute, they leverage the collective insulation expertise of their organization and members to empower homeowners and professionals to make informed insulation choices. Their mission is to enable a more comfortable, energy efficient, and sustainable future through insulation. And they're constantly working with building professionals, homeowners, government agencies, and public interest, energy and environmental groups to realize that vision. Now, during the course of Dave's presentation, you can submit questions for him. Just use the questions box that's probably on the right side of your screen. I'll review those questions and pose them to Dave during the Q&A time set aside after his presentation. Dave, the floor is yours. Well, great. Thank you, Mike. It's great to be here. Before we start, I'd like to thank Green Builder and the Insulation Institute for setting up this webinar and inviting me to speak. I appreciate it. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge the DOE Building America Research Program, and thank home builder Kehovnanian companies for their valuable partnership and support of a number of Building America projects over the years, including our buried duct research. My goal today is to provide an overview of buried ducts and the recent code changes that allow 
HVAC ducts installed within ceiling insulation. My plan to do that is to briefly discuss some background information on the code changes on buried ducts, including benefits and concerns of buried ducts, and then present the new code requirements for buried ducts. Uh, next, go over key implementation details to successfully transition from a tr traditional attic duct system to a buried duct design. And finally, share some research and field data that support the code changes. Having said that, let's dig in. The first thing I'd like to do is define buried ducts, just so we're all on the same page. Uh, buried ducts simply are heating and cooling air distribution ducts that are insulated, installed close to the ceiling in a vented attic, and covered with attic insulation to minimize, to minimize energy loss. There are additional specific requirements for code compliance, uh, but we'll cover those a little bit later. Uh, a little bit background on the codes. The codes we're talking about here are the IECC, the International Energy Conservation Code, and the IRC, the International Residential Code. Uh, the IRC Energy Chapter, Chapter 11, is essentially the same as the residential provisions of the IECC. Uh, the 2018 IECC provides a prescriptive path that allows buried ducts and addresses performance aspects of buried ducts, namely energy loss and condensation potential. It's, it's important to note that previous editions did not prohibit installation of buried ducts. They were just silent on the subject. So you don't have to wait for the 2018 to be adopted in your jurisdiction. The IRC provides a process to obtain permission for alternative designs, like buried ducts, that are not explicitly approved. Uh, and the practice of burying ducts is currently in use by builders around the country, notably in California, where it's quite common. Um, in essence, the code is prescribing a durable and energy efficient method to transition from traditional attic ducts to a more efficient distribution system, um, and an alternative to installing ducts inside conditioned space or building unvented attics. Um, unvented attics also referred to as sealed attics, encapsulated attics, semi-conditioned, and those are built primarily to house the HVAC systems. But why on earth would anyone consider buried ducts? Why not just install ducts in conditioned space? Uh, the benefits of installing ducts inside conditioned space are well known. Uh, the biggest benefit is reduced heating, cooling, energy losses due to conduction and leakage uh, compared to ducts that are not in inside conditioned space. And when we say inside conditioned space, of course, we mean locating the ducts within the thermal air barrier, so below the ceiling plane, below the ceiling insulation for typical homes with vented attics, and not in vented attics or vented crawl spaces or garages or within exterior walls. But locating ducts and equipment inside conditioned space can be a challenge for some house designs, particularly for slab on grade houses, uh, and two-story houses with open floor plans or without basements. Uh, ducts can be installed within floors, within chases or drop ceilings, but this can get complicated and expensive for builders. Uh, doing so requires additional coordination with trades, uh, for example, for duct installation, framing, air sealing, and, and usually requires additional air barriers and air sealing. Um, and bulkheads below ceilings to conceal ducts may not be acceptable to home buyers. Um, uh, now, building an unvented attic, uh, again, primarily to house the HVAC system, is a viable alternative, but that can have a high first cost, and it may not be as energy efficient as expected. Um, installing traditional attic ducts, again, ducts above the ceiling insulation, is convenient because it allows for a standard duct layout approach for different house designs. Uh, it's simple for the mechanical contractor to come in and install. And also, it does not interfere usually with the builder schedule. But this approach is not energy efficient. Uh, the peak load duct losses can be 20, 30, 40 percent, a major energy penalty. So a, a buried duct system can strike the balance between um, the ease of installation for traditional attic ducts and significant energy savings. In other words, installing buried ducts is a straightforward alternative to um, the traditional attic ducts installed above the ceiling insulation. 
the heating cooling energy savings can be 10 to 20 percent and those savings compare well with systems within unvented attics and can approach the energy savings for ducts installed inside conditioned space. Uh, lower peak loads may also allow for lower capacity, lower cost HVAC systems, um, and they can have a low incremental installed cost. It's potentially a no cost solution. Uh, of course, the cost effectiveness depends on many variables, uh, house design, climate, what duct approach we're comparing to, but a very duct design can help meet whole house energy savings goals as it did in the house in these photos um, below. These photos are actually from our 2009 Berry Duck project. The primary concern with Berry Ducks, I would say, is the potential for condensation at the outer jacket of duct insulation. Uh, it's during the cooling season when this is a potential problem, particularly in humid climates. Condensation can occur when the temperature at the outer surface of the duct, shown here in the image uh, on the top, the top blue arrow. Uh, so when the temperature there at the surf, outer surface drops to the dew point temperature, uh, that's when we have potential for condensation. I think it's worth a moment to describe dew point temperature. Uh, the, the dew point is the temperature at which water vapor within the air condenses into a liquid on a surface. For example, uh, take a look at this psychrometric chart I have, and uh, so uh, for example, I have a, let's say I have 80 degree air, so at the bottom of the tr chart, that's 80 degree dry bulb air, and if I follow the red line up to the 60% RH curve, um, that represents a dew point of 64.9 degrees. In other words, if I have 80 degree air at 60% RH, and I cool that air down temperature-wise without removing any moisture, uh, uh, condensation can start to occur at about 65 degrees. Uh, so we have 55 degree air inside the duct, typically during air conditioning, about 55 degrees, um, and also burying ducts decreases the temperature, lowers the temperature of the outer jacket, which makes sense. You know, during the summer that duct was up in a hot attic, now we're putting it closer to the ceiling and covering it with insulation, so it's going to be a lower temperature there at that outer surface. Um, so buried ducts have a greater potential for condensation. The important point is that the duct insulation value must be sufficient to keep the temperature at the outer surface or outer jacket of the duct above the dew point at the surface to avoid condensation. This slide is a summary of concerns with buried ducts. Uh, we just discussed condensation potential and duct insulation levels. It, it's also important to not overly compress the duct insulation during installation. Uh, that's commonly done at fittings, I think zip ties. Uh, you know, if we need a certain amount of insulation and we compress that, uh, we'll have less R value, and that, of course, could lead to condensation. Um, duct, duct leakage can also be a problem. It can lead to condensation. Think of cold air blowing on a humid surface, cold air that escapes from the air-conditioned air inside the duct. Uh, also, a tear in the outer jacket could allow moist air from the attic into the assembly where it could condense on the inner liner of flex duct or at the surface of a metal duct or fitting. Uh, other concerns uh, are around the energy losses. Uh, there's duct leakage again. Obviously, that's an energy loss to the uh, outside the thermal envelope of the building. Uh, we have conduction losses, and that's through the duct insulation and ceiling insulation. That's shown by the red arrow on the right and the lower image, and uh, energy loss due to displaced ceiling insulation, uh, indicated by the red arrow on the left of that same image. Uh, another concern is proof of performance. Builders and contractors want to know that new methods are durable and field tested, and also that they can perform accurate load calculations and energy modeling. The new code changes address concerns regarding energy loss, condensation, and energy modeling. Uh, there are three fundamental components to the new changes. Uh, first, there are general requirements for buried ducts. Basically, these are minimum values for ceiling insulation and duct insulation to control condensation and energy loss. And there are two components that address the energy modeling. Uh, one is for deeply buried ducts. Um, we, uh, a modeler can claim an effective duct insulation value of R25 if certain criteria are met. 
and another for buried ducts considered inside condition space. A uh, modeler can claim that if certain criteria are met as well. So let's look at each component one at a time. Um, these are the general requirements for buried ducts. Um, supply and return ducts may be fully or partially surrounded by ceiling insulation as long as the um, supply and return duct insulation must be at least R8. That's the first um, provision, except in warm climates, warm climate zones 1A, 2A, 3A, the duct insulation must be at least R13 for supply ducts completely covered with ceiling insulation. So again, that's R13 in those humid climates. And uh, I've got a climate zone map here. Uh, if you're not familiar with the climate zones, uh, you know, there's climate zone one down in tip of Florida, climate zone two, the rest of Florida and some of the Gulf states. Uh, climate, th climate zone three is in brown. This is the warm, humid climates. Um, so those are the climate zones we're talking about. And we're talking about the moist, humid climates, which is to the right of the black vertical line. If you go to the top of that map, the moist climates, the A designation, are the climates we're talking about. Um, so, and, and again, the um, R13 is for supply ducts only, not for return ducts, and for supply ducts that are completely covered with ceiling insulation. Um, next requirement is for ceiling insulation. The uh, ceiling insulation above and below the duct must be at least R19 total, and that's excluding the duct R value. Um, so that's some examples here uh, in, the, in the image. The left one is a partially buried duct. Um, so that's showing R19 minimum insulation below the duct to, conform, to comply with that requirement. Um, then we, in the middle, we have a buried duct uh, shown sitting on top of the bottom truss cord. Uh, for example, installed perpendicular to the truss. Um, that's got an R19 total. Uh, the sum of the insulation above the duct and below the duct must be R19. And then the image to the right, I've got the a duct sitting on the ceiling, so that's got to have the R19 insulation, ceiling insulation above that duct. And again, the important thing there is it's excluding the duct R value. So the, the general requirements are pretty straightforward. Uh, keep in mind, all ducts must still be installed in accordance with all other uh, applicable existing codes. For example, uh, duct insulation, by definition, must have an, an outer jacket that's vapor impermeable, an outer surface. Um, and we also have the same duct sealing and duct leakage testing requirements uh, that, we're, that we're used to in the IRC. Okay, well, here are the criteria for deeply buried ducts. And an effective duct insulation value of R25 can be used for ducts that comply with the general requirements for buried ducts, number one, but also with all three of these additional requirements, and these are shown in the image. Um, uh, number one, the duct is located directly on the ceiling or within five and a half inches of the ceiling. Number two, the duct has ceiling insulation of at least R30 on either side. And number three, the duct must be covered on top with at least three and a half inches of ceiling insulation. So three and a half inches of ceiling insulation is about R11 at R3.2 per inch for, um, which is a common value I use anyway for uh, blown attic insulation. And just a note here, if the duct is sitting on the ceiling, we need the R19 ceiling insulation above the duct because we still must comply with the general requirement for an R19 total. So that's just a, just a note with deeply buried ducts. Here are the criteria for buried ducts to be considered inside condition space. Um, these also must comply with the general buried duct requirements and these three additional requirements. Number one, the air handler must be located inside condition space. Number two, the measured duct leakage is within 1.5 CFM 25 per 100 square feet of condition floor area. That's a, uh, that's, that's typically how, uh, that's the metric that uh, ducts are tested to. Uh, that's also in the code. Um, and that's measured at, at the rough end stage or at the final stage. And at final, that would be a total system leakage to outdoors test. So that's an important component of uh, buried ducts considered inside condition space. Uh, 
And number three, the, the R value of insulation above the duct is at least the ceiling, the modeled ceiling insulation R value, less the R value of the duct insulation. So for this one, we can, we can take into account the R value of the duct insulation for this component. Um, and and that's, that number three is shown in the image at the lower right. Um, for example, if I have R38 ceiling insulation and R8 duct, I would need R30 insulation at least above the duct. So those are the three components of the code changes, uh, but those do beg some questions. And um, one question, first question that comes to my mind is, well, R8 ducts are common, but how do we get to R13 ducts for fully buried ducts in humid climates? Uh, one way is to encapsulate the ducts using closed cell spray foam. Um, that's recognized in the code and uh, is, I would say, the most common current practice for buried ducts in humid climates. Uh, and the photo on the left shows spray foam applied over a trunk, and in that case, not the, the, the branch in the lower right side. So there's an encapsulated trunk, an example of one. Um, and duct encapsulation can also help control duct leakage. Uh, another method is to install R6, R6 duct wrap over R8 duct insulation. Um, you know, maybe not the most practical, but it, at the moment that it's an option. Uh, R13 duct wrap is available, but not very common. Uh, it's, and again, it's got to have the uh, vapor retarder surface. Uh, concentric flex ducts is another method. Uh, the, you could install R8 flex duct within R6 duct uh, flex duct. Uh, the photo on the lower right shows just that. We have concentric ducts. Those are both R8 in that photo. Uh, we actually did this in a test house. Uh, once. So the, uh, and finally the, you know, another method is R13 flex duct when it becomes available. Uh, so we'll have to see how the market responds to, uh, to this, uh, you know, it's a supply and demand thing. Uh, and a reminder is to not overly compress the duct insulation. So we want to maintain that full, full value to uh, avoid condensation concerns. Another key detail to get right is duct sealing. Um, leakage is an energy loss and, and can increase the risk of con condensation. Um, uh, ducts must still meet the IRC sealing requirements, like I mentioned, and that that is a uh, that requirement is four CFM 25 per 100 square feet uh, square uh, of conditioned floor space, um, and uh, that's either measured at rough in or final stage. Uh, or uh, 3 CFM25 when the air handler is not already installed during a rough-in test. Um, so, but leakage testing does not measure the continuity of, at the uh, duct's outer vapor barrier, the outer jacket, except for duckboard it does because uh, for duckboard that outer jacket is the, um, uh, the main uh, air leakage plane. Uh, so visual inspection is important. Um, look for rips, tears. Um, the, the photos here show that show duct, ducts that are sealed with mastic. Uh, the red arrow in the top photo is pointing to some open duct insulation that was later sealed before these ducts were buried. This is actually a section of supplemental duct wrap uh, that was installed over the flex duct at a fitting where duct insulation commonly gets compressed. Uh, in this case, the fitting is a supply branch takeoff at a trunk. Um, another thing about leakage testing. Um, uh, recommend doing that at, at rough end stage uh, and that allows for resealing the ducts if necessary and that's actually a strong recommendation at least uh, if you're uh, contemplating uh, trying the buried duct layout. Um, but air sealing the ceiling penetration is, is important to control energy losses and condensation. Uh, supply register boots are notorious leakage points. Uh, the boots themselves and where those meet at the drywall ceiling uh, so it's important at supply boots and return grills and return boxes uh, because those may not get measured during a rough end stage test, uh, but also at other ceiling penetrations as well. Uh, in addition to energy loss and potential condensation, uh, leakage there can affect results for duct leakage testing and house leakage testing. Ceiling insulation. Uh, this table shows minimum levels of ceiling insulation above 
Barry Ducks. Uh, for my blue box example, um, I mean, uh, this is for a different climate zone. So if I'm in uh, climate zone two or three, if the duct is sitting on a truss, perpendicular to a truss, a two by four in this case, in this example, uh, with R11 loose insulation below the duct, beneath the duct, then I would need um, R8 ceiling insulation above the duct. Now, if I have an R13 bat below the um, below that duct, I can get away with R6, a little bit less. Uh, but if that duct is sitting on the ceiling uh, above the R8, I have R19 because I still need the I still need a total of of R19 for any buried duct, uh, R19 ceiling insulation for any buried duct. Now, if I look at my red box example, uh, I'm looking at deeply buried ducts here in climate zone two or three again. If I have a duct sitting on a uh, um, truss again with R11 beneath, um, then I would need R11 above just because for deeply buried ducts I need at least R11. So technically I need at least three and a half inches of insulation, but I'm, I'm using, I'm assuming that uh, loose insulation at R3.2 per inch. So I'm calling that R11 to meet the um, deeply buried duct requirements. Um, you can see if that's sitting on the ceiling, if that uh, deeply buried duct is sitting on the ceiling, then I've got to go back up to R19 for my general duct requirements. Uh, ceiling insulation again, um, we need to make sure that we have the right amount of ceiling insulation above the ducts and below as required. And here are two examples of quality control for, for that. Uh, the top one I'm using fiberglass bats uh, on the left image above and below. So uh, the idea would be to install those bats uh, after the ducts are installed and then the insulator can come along and install the uh, ceiling insulation. But another alternative or another method is to install flags at the ducts that are marked to indicate the sufficient ceiling insulation above the duct. And again, those are just two, two example methods of uh, uh, providing some quality control for the ceiling insulation. Air handling unit or furnace location. If you're claiming buried ducts considered inside condition space uh, in the energy model, you, you must install, install the air handler or furnace inside condition space, right? That was one of the requirements, um, such as in a mechanical room or a closet. And that's uh, the image on the, on the right is, 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 uh, is to show that. Uh, it's also a, a recommended best practice for, for best energy performance for um, any system, really, but uh, any, any buried duct system. And if you want to still install the air handler in the attic, you can do that. Uh, but it should not be buried to ensure access for maintenance and proper function of the equipment. I'm sure the uh, code of fish will not allow that to be, to be buried. I don't think the manufacturers would approve either. So this is a big one, energy analysis. Um, uh, this is a table from our tech spec that compares estimated energy savings and estimated incremental costs for an example house configuration. It's a, it's a one-story slab on grade, a little more than 2,400 square feet. Uh, it's, it's constructed in accordance with 2015 uh, IRC prescriptive insulation values, also uh, house leakage rates and duct leakage rates for two different climate zones, a 2A and 4A and for various attic and duct designs. My, my red box example um, is for Jacksonville, Florida, climate zone 2A. Uh, I'm showing a heating, an annual heating cooling site energy savings of 15.6% for, uh, I'm sorry, 15.3% for my deeply buried duct. That, this example is with the air handler and return inside condition space. Um, and just above that, the 15.6 uh, is for an unvented encapsulated attic. So, um, and those are those represent savings compared to the baseline, which I indicate with a, a red arrow. Um, that's for standard uh, attic ducts installed above the ceiling insulation. Uh, so we're calling that our baseline. And if you go down to the green arrow, that's showing uh, an analysis of this house. Uh, 
for ducks completely inside conditioned space. So we're getting up to 26.8% in that example. And the thing to rem remember is this, this is an example. Um, uh, the, uh, you know, part of, this also, part of this table also included incremental costs. So the, 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 for the energy portion, I used my HVAC software to, to model the energy costs. And for the estimated incremental costs, um, those were those were calculated um, using RS means and 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 contractor input. Uh, for my load calculations, my my HVAC software allows me to model deeply buried ducts. I can specify duct insulation at least up to R30. For duct leakage, I need to man manipulate the duct tightness designations in the software to accurately model my target leakage rates for both total and leakage to outdoors. Um, so a designer may need to work through some iterations for a given design to, to accurately model for the target leakage rate. Um, for, for energy modeling, most software can model buried ducts. The, the duct leakage and insulation around the duct can be specified. It's an estimation, but I would say it's a, a pretty good estimation. So I, I can model for ducts inside condition space and deeply buried ducts, uh, but modeling for buried ducts inside, or buried ducts considered inside condition space may require some discussion between the builder and, and energy rater, acknowledging, acknowledging there will be some level of duct losses, however small. Well, those were the key details to consider for successfully implementing a buried duct design. Uh, the next few slides show some results from our field studies. This is our 2009 mixed humid project. It's located in central New Jersey. It's a 2,500 square foot single story slab on grade house. The supply ducts are in the attic. The return ducts and furnace are inside conditioned space. Uh, it has deeply buried ducts. So the duct system, it, uh, it's an R8 supply duct system. So it's got R8 flex ducts. It's got a metal trunk wrapped with R8 duct wrap and it has metal boots also wrapped with R8 duct wrap. And before the wrap, those were sealed using mastic. Uh, then the ducts in the attic were encapsulated, uh, the supply trunk and the register boots, but not the branches. So um, uh, you can see in the middle picture down there, in the, uh, the, uh, before the encapsulation, we had the, the uh, wrapped metal trunk and the flex branches. Um, the, so the key results at that house, that project, uh, the measured duct leakage at rough end was one uh, CFM per 20, one CFM 25 for 100 square feet of condition floor area. And that was for the attic ducts only. Um, and that was measured before spray foam. So we, we had a pretty tight duct system before the spray foam. Uh, and the, the sequence was the, we, we tested that duct system before encapsulation, then the ceiling was installed then the trunk and the uh, register boots were encapsulated. But we had that good uh, rough in number before encapsulation. Uh, the duct leakage at final measured 3.4 total and zero leakage to outdoors. So that the difference there, the additional, you know, difference between the one and the 3.4, um, uh, you know, some combination of the, uh, the added ceiling that the encapsulation provided plus the, uh, the leakage at the furnace and the uh, trunk ducts and plenum below the ceiling. Um, so um, we, we installed a number of sensors there. Uh, we installed sensors uh, uh, at the top side and bottom of the trunk and same for the uh, three of the supply branches had sensors at the top near the bottom and at the side. And of course, we're measuring ambient as well, conditions inside the attic, conditions inside the house and outdoors. Uh, so the, you know, I think key takeaway from the project was there was no condensation, uh, none measured or observed over two summers, uh, notably on the R8 branch ducts. Uh, and we visited a number of times to download data and actually put our hands on uh, areas where those sensors were and dug around through there and didn't, didn't see any signs of, of condensation there at, the, uh, at that project. So this is our 2012 mixed human project in Maryland. Um, this has a two-story house with a full basement. The, 
Second floor uh, duct system is is a buried duct system. Um, uh, this house has a gas furnace in the basement and supply and return trunks running up through the house into the attic uh, through a chase. Um, the deeply buried ducts here, uh, we have R16 supply branches. This, this is the house that used the concentric uh, flex duct that I showed earlier. Um, and just R8 registered boots. So we had metal boots wrapped with normal duct wrap. Uh, the metal trunk was not wrapped with duct wrap, but it was encapsulated. Um, so after, so the system was installed. Um, the uh, the trunk was encapsulated, but not the branches or the boots in this case. Uh, the results that duct leakage here at Ruffin measured 1.9 CFM 25 per 100 square feet. Um, and a note that was actually the same before and after encapsulation. We actually measured it um, at both points. Um, the final duct leakage rate was a little higher than expected. It was 4.3 to outdoors. Um, we attributed that to a, to leakage at the chase and the trunks, uh, and those were uh, subsequently resealed. Even though we, I did not get a chance to retest that house, but um, so we don't have the uh, true after measurement for the final duct leakage there. But despite that, no condensation was measured or observed either at this house over two full summers. Um, th this is a Building America study by Stephen Winters Associates of the Consortium for Advanced Residential Buildings, or CARB. Uh, the focus is on retrofit applications in a hot, humid climate. But this is a very thorough, valuable study on buried ducts. It includes lots of historical data and research. Uh, one key finding is um, uh, buried and encapsulated ducts show no signs, uh, no, no potential for condensation in a hot, humid climate. So the, the duct they're referring to in this report is um, the old level of flex duct insulation, R4 nominal flex ducts, with one and a half inches of closed cell spray foam. That's about R13 total, nominal, at R6 per inch for the spray foam. And uh, that's a minimum recommendation uh, because they predicted condensation for just the R4.2 ducts in a uh, humid climate. Um, they also uh, noted that duct leakage rates for existing homes were substantially reduced through encapsulation. And I would say that's to be inspect expected for older homes um, before today's duct tightness requirements. Um, and a lot of valuable information, uh, the report has a lot of valuable information around effective R values. Um, I, I would say this research supports the new code requirements for insulation levels. Also, the companion measure guideline supports the DOE Zero Energy Ready Home program that allows encapsulated buried ducts as an exception to installing ducts inside conditioned space, even though for that program they require an R8. So they, they require R8 encapsulated by at least an inch and a half. This is our 2014-2015 hot humid project. Um, it's located in Beaufort County. It's in the low country of coastal South Carolina. It's climate zone 3A, but literally across the river from 2A. Uh, this is a 2,300 square foot house, single story, slab on grade again. Um, uh, take a look at the graph on the lower left of the slide. Um, these are average dew point temperatures for selected locations. Um, if, if, if you look at Beaufort, South Carolina, uh, the, the middle column there from June to September, uh, it's got an average dew point of 70, which is a couple, couple of degrees below some of these other selected cities, Jacksonville, New Orleans, Houston, Melbourne, Florida. But if I if I zoom into July and August, uh, the the average dew points during that period are almost the same uh, as those other cities in the in, in in what many consider a more humid uh, climate. So we we th we thought this was a great location uh, to test buried ducks and condensation. It's it's a very humid place. Um, so uh, this is this house has deeply buried ducts. Uh, it's got R30 ceiling insulation mounted above those ducts. 
Uh, it's R8 branch ducts and boots. Uh, we do have one R12 branch just for comparison. And the supply trunk and return trunk are duckboard, uh, R8.7 duckboard. And the whole assembly is sealed with mastic only. Um, and also the, the, the plan was to uh, seal the ceiling plane, that's uh, the supply register booth, the return box, uh, and top plates and penetration uh, using the single part canned foam. Uh, that was the uh, air sealing plan for that, that house. Um, another note, it was the estimated annual heating cooling uh, savings were 21% compared to uh, the same house with ducts up in the attic, traditional ducts above ceiling insulation. That did get adjusted down to 20% based on the uh, final duct leakage summer, but I'll, I'll get to that in a moment. Um, so key results, uh, duct leakage at rough end, we have, here I've got target and measured. So our target was one CFM 25 per 100 square feet. I measured 1.2 CFM 25 for that house. Um, I think it's worth pointing out that uh, these are pretty small flow numbers we're talking about. The, you know, so this is a um, 2,300 square foot house. So we were looking to measure 23 CFM with our duct blaster, and I ended up measuring about 28 CFM. So, so one way to say it, you could look at it that well, okay, that's 20% greater than the target. On the other hand, it's a pretty small number, so it's a that's a very tight duct system at rough end, and that was measured measuring the um, ducts at rough end ab above the ceiling plane and some of the uh, plums as well. Now the final duct leakage, uh, the target was three. We came up with three as a, as a good uh, target for that. It actually measured 5.5 and 4.3 of that was outdoors. So I knew it was a tight duct system because I measured it. Um, so we actually attributed the uh, additional loss there to uh, the supply boots and return plan of not being sealed at the ceiling plane. Uh, and those, we actually uh, uh, know that that was resealed even though I didn't have an opportunity to retest that system. Uh, uh, key takeaways, that there was no condensation measured or observed over one and a half summers at this uh, test house. Uh, another key result was Barry Ducks delivered colder air, a nearly on average about seven degrees colder uh, than the attic ducts that were not covered. So for this house, we, this was a test house. We actually deeply buried the ducts in front of the house, and we did not deeply bury the ducts in the back of the house. So those were installed uh, in the rear of the house more conventionally. So we had a way to compare uh, the performance of those ducts. So, but the colder air temperatures during cooling, you know, uh, shows improved comfort to the occupant and indicates energy savings as well. Um, so. For that house, we installed a, a number of sensors um, uh, on a number of different duct surfaces, uh, you know, for supply branches at the top, middle, near the bottom. Same thing for the trunks, uh, um, ambient conditions. But we also installed a center tree, and there's a, the top photo shows the tree before it's installed. So I've got the four sensors to the right, and uh, those are designed to measure the conditions within the ceiling insulation. So the picture on the, the lower picture shows that tree installed, uh, in, in, indicated by the red arrow. Uh, so that's that's how we, uh, we, we looked at the uh, gradients inside the ceiling insulation. And of course, condensation is not indicated when the, the temperature is above the dew point temperature in any, any given location. Uh, so that's the, just want to show you that tree sensor we installed. Um, okay, so this is the squiggly line portion um, of the presentation. I have about a dozen slides here uh, with sample data. Uh, the summer before the South Carolina test house was built, we installed sensors within the ceiling insulation of an existing house. So it's also in, Calif uh, in uh, South Carolina uh, in a nearby house. But this, these measurements uh, in the existing home were taken in 2014. Um, so, again, we, we wanted to investigate the gradients, the temperature and dew point gradients within the ceiling insulation. This slide simply shows an example two-day period of uh, 
typical warm, humid conditions. Uh, the temperature outside, you know, it's pushing 90. The dew point outside looks like it's sort of about 70. Uh, attic temperature up to about 120 degrees during the day. Uh, so I got this. So this slide, I've got the same two days, same two-day period. The indoor dew point, looking uh, mid 50s and low 50s. So AC is running, uh, doing a pretty good job there. The outdoor dew point. You know, bumping along just just about hitting 70 degrees there. But look at the dew point in the attic. It ranges from the 40s to the mid 80s. It peaks in the afternoon. The uh, the vertical lines are 12 hours apart, so it's peaking there in the middle just after noon. So uh, it's probably about two or three o'clock there. Um, we first saw this dew point curve during our 2009 project. I was surprised. I didn't expect to see this you know, this this range of attic dew point. Um, but uh, subsequently looking at earlier research, we, we've, we've come across the same same curve. Um, so I just want to point that out. This is simply expanded cooling season data it's just to show that, that that dew point in the attic, the blue line, um, we, that we're getting that consistently. Uh, and I've compared it to the orange line, which is the outdoor dew point. You know, that's, that's varying maybe three, four degrees, but the, the dew point in the attic has that big, big range. And again, this is still at the existing home in uh, Bluffton, South Carolina. Um, so here, same two days uh, as we started off with. Um, th these are showing the, the dew points and, and temperature gradients within the ceiling insulation. So these are the sensors installed one inch, three and a half inches, uh, six and a half inches, eight inches above the ceiling. Um, and the takeaway here is that the, um, the, uh, the dew points within the ceiling insulation are well below the attic dew point in the afternoon, which, if you recall, was you know up about 85 or so in this period. Uh, you know, early research generally predicted high potential for condensation when the ducts were, um, or the, rather, when the duct surface temperature dropped to the attic dew point temperature. But reviewing the early data and these gradients gave us confidence that R8 ducks were most likely safe. Okay, so uh, I got a couple more of these slides, and then uh, now we're back to our test house in South Carolina. So this is August of 2015. This is an example period of, of hot and humid conditions. I'm in the 90s. I'm, my dew point's pushing 80. This is, this is real humid here. Um, temperature in my attic is not quite, well, it's up to 120 in the one one day. Um, so again, my outside temperatures, you know, I'm in the 90s. Um, so that, those are the example conditions for these next couple of slides. Um, okay, so this is that, a similar dew point curve to the existing house. Um, it's the same pre, uh, period as the previous slide. It shows the gradient, uh, the dew point gradient. Um, you can see the up in the attic, I'm, back up to 85, dipping down to about 60 at nighttime. The indoor dew point is just below 60 degrees. You know, it looks like it's running between 55 and 60. And the tree sensors, uh, the arrows pointing to those three sensors, those are at three and a half inches, six inches, and eight and a half inches above uh, the ceiling. So it's just a, another look at that, that unusual uh, dew point curve. Um, so now this slide, we're actually getting down to some actual buried duct conditions. This is a six inch diameter R8 flex duct. The sensor's installed at the side of it, so it's about five and a half inches above the ceiling. Um, it's the same worst case period as the previous slide. Um, you know, the, the takeaway here is the temperature is well above the dew point, even though it's closest during the early afternoon. Um, this data shows the temperature remains about eight to 10 degrees above the dew point. Um, so here's the same six inch flex duct, but I've inserted the, the insulation tree sensors, the three and a half inch and the six inch sensor. And the, the, the takeaway here is that the, the dew point at the duct tracks below the dew point of the sensors. You know, the, the duct dew point seems to be uh, lower than one would expect based on the sensor location, uh, you know, the corresponding sensor location. And this is something we noticed consistently with our, our measurements either, either at ducts or um, uh, at Boots as well. Uh, same six inch duct in this slide, but we've just expanded the cooling season. And this runs August to September 2015. 
And the takeaway is just the, the duct surface temperature remains well above the dew point um, for, that entire, for that entire period. This is a four inch diameter R8 flex duct. And uh, I've got the sensor at the bottom. Uh, four inch diameter is considered worst case, just based on the small diameter. And you can see the temperature is well above the dew point here. Now we've, we've, this is the same four inch duct, but this sensor is at the side. And the temperature and dew point are a little bit closer here compared to the uh, previous slide. And again, same four inch diameter duct, expanded cooling season, showing the uh, uh, temperature above the dew point. So all of our data looks similar to this. Uh, the temperature remains above the, uh, the dew point. Um, again, this, this house is for common R8 ducts and conventional duct sealing and condensation does not appear to be a cause for concern. Now, this is one house, one study, so it's too early to claim that R8 works all the time in human climates. But, but I would say the data supports the R13 code requirement as, as a conservative requirement. And this is one more squiggly line slide. Uh, instead of dew point, this takes a look at RH. Uh, uh, and it, it's that same worst case duck, worst case period. And the takeaway here is the RH remains, the relative humidity remains at a pretty safe level. It's, it might be hard to read, but the top of that line is in the low 80%, probably 81, 82%. Uh, and again, that was the worst we measured um, for that summer, 2015, uh, most of August and, and September. So um, to wrap it up, uh, buried ducts and vented attics should perform well if they're constructed in accordance with the new code provisions. Um, you don't have to wait for the 2018 IRC to be approved locally, but you do need to seek approval to do it. Um, uh, energy savings are good compared to tr traditional attic ducts. Uh, I estimate 8 to 20 percent annual heating, cooling, energy savings for deeply buried ducts. Um, and deeply buried ducts can be a cost-effective alternative to building semi-conditioned attics. I think there are similar energy savings uh, at likely less cost, or for installing ducts inside conditioned space. Um, some key details to keep in mind. Um, duct insulation must be well installed, not compressed. Um, ducts must be well sealed. Re I recommend testing at rough-in. Uh, for quality control. Um, we also need quality control measures uh, for ensuring proper levels of ceiling insulation at the buried ducts. Uh, that's an important one. Um, load calculations uh, for those, um, for equipment selection. At this point, it may be a bit of an iterative process. It might require some manipulation for the designer. Uh, same for energy modeling, and, and that may require some, some level of collaboration between the builder, energy rater, and uh, code official. Uh, particularly for the buried ducts considered inside conditioned space. So that wraps up my presentation. And, uh, All right, thanks, Dave. Well, we've got a ton of questions to get to, um, some of which we'll probably have to go back through some of the slides to, to help provide some context or reference. Um, sure thing. So we're going to get right to the questions, and I'm going to go back up to Harris's question. Is there any possibility of applying the 2018 IECC and some of the requirements, I'm assuming he's, he's also asking about some of these requirements, to their current 2015 IECC requirements in Maryland? For, for Barry Ducks. Um, sure. I think that... It's, uh, I think I mentioned that, that there is a mechanism in the IRC um, that allows one to um, apply to, uh, you know, do a method or install a device that's not explicitly approved in the code, but it's, but it's this, as I mentioned, this Barry Duck system is not, um, you know, the previous codes did not preclude installing the Duck system. so. Um, there's actually provision, and I'm, my memory is telling me it's in section 104 
It might be 104.11. Don't hold me to it, but that's actually a provision in the IRC that allows one to um, apply to um, install an alternative system uh, anywhere. Um, not to say that you'd get approval necessarily, but I think, yeah. So, so yes, I think uh, you certainly could apply to, to do it now. Yeah, I think, you know, uh, the other thing I would mention is if they're going through the update or amendment process, I mean, they could certainly have this as a, as a code change proposal. So, I mean, to, to bring it into the existing code, I think you're going to have to look at is there an update period or any kind of amendment period to introduce it. I don't, I don't know if we can just say, oh, this is a good idea, let's bring it in right now. Usually those things are kind of structured. Wouldn't you agree, Dave? I would agree. I think that you know, a point of reference would be, um, you know, so if you're applying for something like that, I think I would reference the new code and even the tech note that we have um, on the uh, Installation Institute site or um, our site. All right, I want to get to uh, a question from Anthony. Um, he wanted to know, how, how do you bury the air handler? And can you even do that or... Um, Will it nullify or will it affect any way the manufacturer's warranty? Well, so that's a good question, and I, I would not recommend burying an air handler. Um, you know, that's one of those details that, uh, you know, so on the, on the screen now, the left image shows the air handler in the attic above the ceiling plane, and we just come right out and say we should not bury that. Uh, we want to make sure there's access to that for maintenance and proper functioning of the equipment. So. Uh, yeah, I think at this point, the simple answer is don't bury it. Okay. Uh, Armando had a question, uh, and he wants to focus on Climate Zone 3. Um, shouldn't ducts be encapsulated with two inches of closed cell foam on top of the R8 jacket to avoid condensation? Well, they certainly can be. That's a viable method. The um, so, But the code is saying... Uh, if we're if we've got a completely let's go back to that slide for the um, you know the code requirement um, leaving the general so so for warm humid climates including this three um, we have to have R13 duct insulation for supply ducts so there are different ways to get to that R13 one is as he mentioned encapsulating an R8 duct with sufficient spray foam, and it does have to be closed cell, or, it, you know, the code doesn't prescribe how to get to R13, it just says you need R13, um, and that's why, you know, we looked at a couple of different methods to to get there, um, you know, and one, so this is the slide where I talked about how do we get to R13 ducts, one is encapsulated, the others, middle two are sort of creative ways, but they work, um, and again, finally, R13 when it becomes available. Okay. Uh, we've got a couple of follow-up questions on this topic, so I want to hit those before I go back to some of the other questions that have been previously asked. Um, give me just a second here. Uh, oh, can, uh, Anthony wanted a follow-up question. Can builders still keep the air handler in the attic with the latest code? Well, I'm not aware of any reason that they're not. Um, you mean, so with, with this code? With the 2018. Uh, well, for unless there's another provision I'm not aware of, but um, but for for Barry Ducks, it doesn't. You're allowed to still install the air handler or furnace in the attic. It's the exception is for uh, for when the when for the energy modeling where we're claiming that um, uh, that that Barry Ducks are considered inside condition space for, for modeling in the energy model. It, and for that, the air handler must be installed inside condition space. Okay, and then uh, staying with the air handler for just a moment, <clears throat> Eric had a question that if you don't have your air handler buried or in condition space, what percentage do you model the distribution system as being in condition space? <laughs> That's a good question. So you have duct area. So you've, you basically you've got two different types of losses. You've got duct conduction duct conduction losses and you have duct leakage losses. Um, you know, the duct insulation, uh, the, the software 
uh, calculates the square footage of um, of duct area, and you can either assign that to the attic, or you can assign that duct to the to inside condition space. Um, so from a, it's it's not quite as clear though when it comes to the air handler. I think the the big loss with the air handler. Um, there's certainly conduction losses, but I think the, the biggest potential loss is with the um, air leakage. Um, so they've been required to be uh, tight within 2% of the system airflow for a few code cycles. But um, that goes back to when I did my, using my Manual J software, I actually manipulated the, um, the, the duct, duct leakage um, uh, based on um, the, um, I should go back to that slide. The I should go back to the um, energy slide. I think. Um, well, it's basically you know th there are ways within the software to manipulate your duct leakage, and so you you can do that. The the software tells you leakage per square foot of duct. So you've got to you've got to back out the 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 total leakage and then the leakage per 100 square feet. Um, so when I did my examples here, um, I, I was sure to call the total duct leakage for CFM. 25 per 100 square feet, uh, as required by code. Um, but then I can I can change the, the notation in the software. Um, mine is you know it's notable or, or extreme or average um, duct ceiling. It has a corresponding CFM leakage per square foot of duct. So I that's that's the iterative process uh, of of um, uh, and I can I can actually change those numbers to to uh, make the air handler. To model the air handler either in the attic or in the inside condition space. Gotcha. I'm not sure that's very uh, clear. But. I wanted to uh, <clears throat> I recognize that obviously we're at the top of the hour, but Dave told us beforehand that he could stay longer, and I hope that a lot of our attendees can because we have got a lot of great questions. And uh, me personally, I always like to get to every question that gets sent in. So um, I encourage the audience to stick around with us and this recording will be available later that people can go back and listen. But I want to make sure I get to people's questions. And if you're sticking around waiting for your question, I really appreciate that. I want to stick with, I know this isn't, the whole webinar isn't about air handlers, but I want to make sure I'm trying to nail some of these topics because we've got so many questions coming in. Um, Michael made a suggestion of building a box of like uh, rigid foam insulation and, and encapsulate their handler in that so it can be removed for service. Um, we had another question about, um, is there an energy penalty um, for the air handling unit being exposed in the attic? I don't know if, if there's such an energy penalty or not. Well, I think the software, again, takes into account that the, the location of the air handler. So, um, you know, it's primarily, the losses are primarily the duct, but certainly the air handler poses a, uh, you know, potential loss for sure. Um, so, so I rely on on, on the, the software to to recognize if the air handler's in in um, inside condition space or up in the attic. Um, as far as building a box around the air handler, yeah, those kind of things uh, are fine as long as long as they're fine with the code official. Um, uh, my experience has been that uh, building uh, boxes like that, or rooms, or even duct chases. It's, it can be very challenging to to air seal those. So, and they're not necessarily um, communicating with condition space either. So, um, you know, it's sort of it's it's not unlike it's like a mini semi-conditioned attic, right? It's 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 a semi-conditioned space. Uh, um, y you know, so it, I, I, somebody could try that with as long as they got code approval to, and I, I would think manufacturer's approval as well to. To enclose the box, obviously, you know, right. for example, gas furnaces come to mind as far as a reason to not do that. But I think it's challenging to to uh, to seal that if it's even something that would be approved by manufacturers or code officials. Well, you bring up a great point. You know, you don't want to get on the wrong side of the code official. So, mm -hmm. um, okay, so we're going to move on. Uh, uh, Robbie had a question, and I don't remember the exact slide it was, but when he sent this in, you had three examples that were on the screen, and, and um, it was early, maybe 10, 15 minutes into your presentation, 
And uh, his question was, uh, are you saying that any of the three examples can be used? He was especially wondering about partially insulated ducts. Yeah, there you go. I think that's the slide right there. Well, it's not partially insulated ducts. It's partially buried ducts. So, so yes, the code, and I, um, it's actually why I referred to reading this slide. Uh, i tried to word it as clearly as I, I could. Uh, so it's, it's supply and return ducts may be fully or partially surrounded by ceiling insulation. So they're allowed to be partially buried, like the um, example duct on the left side of that image. Um, you know, I, I, so I still have to have at least R8 duct insulation, and I need R13 if I'm in climate zone 1A, 2A, or 3A, and I also have to have uh, a minimum amount of ceiling insulation. I still need that R19 insulation under the duct in that case uh, because that's a requirement for the uh, that's one of the general criteria for for buried ducts and that that speaks to displaced ceiling insulation so there's it's a certain minimum level of ceiling insulation um, even though some of that is displaced by the duct okay um, and, and going right along that with that that image on the left side um, Anthony had a question that how do we guarantee that the insulation levels are maintained over time due to either settlement or maybe homeowners store some things in their attic or the cable guy moves the insulation to run cable? How, how do we guarantee that or, or at least try to guarantee that? Well, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, I mean, I think the – so if it did get disturbed, the lack of insulation would affect the energy performance. It wouldn't – it would not create – um, more of a condensation concern. Um, so, and again, I think that's an that's an important question, and one I I, I tried to address here with a couple of examples. Um, for one of our project houses, we actually use the um, the the ceiling insulation markers that normally get put off. We um, the, the idea was to install those on either side of the duct to get stapled to the uh, um, trusses. Um, um, so, in the case of a marker, uh, the flag marker there, my example, uh, the idea would be to have an indication on that post that, that, that this is the right amount of ceiling insulation. And in the, the example using the fiberglass bats, that's just a visual, and that's where, as long as they're still on top of the duct, uh, number one, you can you know where they're located, and you should normally be able to see the top of those normally. And is it is it considered inside if it's partially buried? Is it considered inside conditioned space? Well, I think it's you know inside the inside the insulation maybe because uh, obviously conditioned space with the attic. I mean, if you're not conditioning that space, then it's outside the conditioned space. But I think what the question maybe might be referring to is is it considered inside the insulation if it's partially buried? Where where does that percentage break? Does it have to be completely? Uh, buried in no, insulation. There, oh no, no it's, it's, it's saying inside. In, it's, it's, uh, excuse me. He is saying inside condition space. Oh, he is. No, um, for inside condition space, we have um, this slide. So all these criteria must be met. You know, number one, it's got to be within the general requirements for buried ducts. Uh, then it also has to meet these three additional requirements: the air handler inside condition space, the measured duct leakage, and that's a mighty tight duct system right there. And um, even though the, you know, um, most of our projects would have passed the uh, total leakage to outdoors test, um, but the, the R value of the insulation must be at least the ceiling insulation R value, less the R value of the duct insulation. So the example would be, uh, if it meets all the other requirements, the ceiling insulation, if for example, we were modeling R38, and if that was an R8 duct, then that ceiling insulation above the duct must be at least R30. Okay. For, and uh, that's for ducts inside but, conditioned space. But deeply buried duct, it's, a, it's not as large a requirement. Okay, gotcha. Certainly appreciate all the questions that are coming in. We are getting to them, I promise. Um, a couple questions uh, along the topic of, of spraying. Um, can you spray flex duct? Yeah, 
You mean, um, I'm not sure, I'm not sure if well, that refers to spray I, I think insulation. I've got context. I think I've got some context here. Are there any rules or restrictions, requirements, or anything like that, that builders might face spraying foam to existing flex duct, like, let's say, a retrofit situation? Oh, well, yeah, I mean, I think there are. I think, um, again, it's it's certainly a viable approach. Um, I think you have quality control issues, but yeah, so if it's a retrofit situation, you're going to have some some ceiling insulation, presumably, to uh, move out of the way. Um, applying the right thickness of spray foam can be a challenge. Um, I, I uh, you know, you want to make sure you have a certain minimum level there. Um, after it's applied, you don't know unless you have a little gauge. I use a uh, a paper clip that I poke in and then measure the, the uh, how deep the uh, how thick the spray insulation is, uh, but uh, I mean there there are restrictions using uh, you know two part spray foam as far as you know installer could have to suit up and usually have to clear the house for a day or so and uh, those kind of restrictions. But but uh, and 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 technically I guess another one I think of is uh, anytime you have flexible duct I mean it can move the the spray foam is quite stiff but I guess if you know, if everything shifted for some reason, somebody moved it, uh, it could crack. Yeah. Okay. The insulation, uh, you know, the spray foam could, could break. Gotcha. That's, fine. That's pretty durable, I, I would say. So, so there was a slide, and I, I wish I could remember exactly which slide it was, but it had a photo on the right side, and Rick noticed that it had two vapor barriers. Um, yes. Do you have any concerns about that? That's a good question. I've had that question for maybe this one, possibly because well, oh, okay, well, it could be the concentric duct as well. That might, maybe that's a better one, right? Um, certainly, there is one here, and I mentioned this one got sealed. Um, this one, so the lower right photo there, we've got concentric flex ducts. So each one of those has an outer jacket that is a vapor barrier. So the way I look at this is. You you do you know something like this? You do need to seal both of those vapor barriers. So you install the inner liner first, and this would apply to duct wrap as well. Um, and you've got to seal that, and then you you know you you pull the other outer jacket over it, and you've got to seal that as well. So I think you're sealing both. And I, I look at it as I think you know the duct sealing is critical for any duct system in an attic, whether it's buried or not, um, and I would look at it as almost, this is almost another layer of protection. So if for some reason the uh, moisture were to get through a tear, for example, in the outer jacket, you'd still have the inner jacket that would provide protection against condensation. So it's a, it's a good question, but I've got, in this case, I really have three vapor barriers. And um, uh, potentially, yeah, you, you, if, if it's not installed properly, yes, you could get moisture on the maybe on the inner surface, but, um, um, uh, and I say maybe because I think you still have an R8 insulated jacket at that point at the inner surface, so um, I don't really, I wouldn't really anticipate a problem, but uh, I, to me, if it's done properly, I would, I would think that'd be more of a backup. Okay. So let's move now to the, um, some of the testing that you were doing with leakage and CFM. Mm -hmm. um, so Andy asked a question, how are you measuring leakage at 3.4 CFM total? He points out that ring C on the Minnesota duct blasters is not calibrated below 10 CFM. Oh, well, okay. <laughs> that's, excuse me, I, I uh, abbreviate. That's, that's 3.4 CFM 25 for 100 square feet, so it's not, that's not CFM. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> I, I, um, I neglected to uh, put the rest of the notation there. Okay, gotcha. Um, Leslie had a couple of questions. Um, do you have any uh, real utility data on the completed test homes? Uh, and I think you answered the other one that she's got, but we'll, we'll go to this one first. Do you have any real utility data on the completed test homes? Okay, so for this test house on the screen, we have a lot of utility data, but 
this was a uh, Building America new construction test house, and it includes, um, even though we were measuring power for the HVAC, among other things, we were measuring total power, but this is really, you know, the buried duct component was just that, was one component of a number of, um, uh, you know, thermal enclosure improvements, including um, uh, better insulated walls, more insulated, uh, more insulation in the attic, uh, at least you know for that for that period, uh, better windows, uh, a very tight house as well. So um, I don't know that I would be able to um, um, break out the the incremental savings that the uh, that the duct system alone. We could estimate it, but I don't have any hard data on 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 the duct the buried duct component for this project. Um, for this project, no, I don't have any. This was this project was only to measure for potential condensation, um, so I don't have data for that. And this house is unique because uh, I think I mentioned that uh, for this house, the front half of the house, we buried the ducts. The back half of the house, we did not. So, you know, the, the upside there is we have some really interesting comparative data, including the uh, colder air temperatures during air conditioning in the front of the house than the back, but um, so and the so I, but I wouldn't you know it was it wouldn't quite translate because the house and we're not we're not monitoring this house anyway. But even if we were, the buried ducts I guess you know again would have to be uh, estimated because it's only half roughly half of the uh, duct area is buried. And so for my estimated annual heating cooling savings, it was just at an estimate based on if as if that entire house had buried ducks. Okay. I think you clarified this earlier, but just to make sure, the final duct leakage numbers, are they in the uh, CFM 25 or are they in ACH? Yeah, I apologize for the notation. Those For this, they're in CFM 25. Okay. For this okay. slide presentation. And some of this information is in various reports. We, we, we report both. Uh, but here, I'm, I'm, um, unless uh, yeah, I'm, I'm looking at CFM 25 per 100 square feet of condition floor area. Gotcha. Kevin wanted to know why does the attic dew point swing so much? That's a great question. I don't really know, except um, you know I've I've heard some some pretty smart people discuss that, and it, I think I think it may have to do with the uh, building materials absorbing and desorbing moisture during the day, uh, and it's on that daily cycle. And it's it's no accident that that curve happens. We see that's a similar curve even in enclosed, you know, sealed attics. But um, but um, um, we for sure uh, see that curve in all of our projects for buried ducks. And I think I mentioned in in the earlier. Um, Building America report, even in the appendix, there's that same curve. So, but to answer the question, I'm getting off track, which I tend to do. But the, um, uh, I, I, I believe it could be due to the uh, the roof deck and other building components absorbing and desorbing moisture during the day. You bring up that moisture question, and Leslie had a question about this. Uh, is there a concern with condensation over time in a real life situation where there are Various people in the attic, uh, AC service, or maybe you're working on a ceiling fan or speaker installs. I would think that you're not going to have. I mean, it's, your attic typically isn't a crowded, high traffic area, but in the construction phase, it certainly could be. Um, but so, is there a concern with any of that in the early part of of construction? Well, yeah. I mean, I, I think there is is a concern. I think the uh, you know the the building super or the you know the site superintendent um, you know I think that's sometimes why that's one reason why ducks sometimes get hung high in an attic uh, in my opinion sometimes too close to the roof deck uh, because it does keep them out of the way during construction I think most rough ends occur before drywall and you know an ins ceiling insulation isn't put in until Drywall, so that's a good concern. I think you know. I think maybe after the house is built, uh, I think there's two components to that answer. I would say, 
yeah, if somebody disturbs the location of the ceiling insulation, I think that would affect the, uh, certainly the energy performance. I don't think that would affect the, I don't think that would uh, increase the risk for condensation potential. Um, but uh, no, if somebody steps on it or breaks, you know, any, any duct system, if you do something to create a leak where you have cold air in the summertime blowing on a warm surface, then yeah, I mean, I'm losing energy in that case, and I'm also losing, you know, also I'm increasing the risk for condensation. But um, I don't know if that's, uh, maybe it's a little bit more uh, of a possibility to happen because the duct system is buried. That's a good argument to make sure that duct, um, those ducts are, are, are marked out so that somebody can see where the ducts are as they're required to do in California. Now, um, on the South Carolina test home, mm -hmm. where was the sensor tree in relation to the supply trunk to the air handler connection? Yeah, I've got a photo of that. It's, um, let, me get to, let me get to that. That photo was from the test house. So I'm going to say, there's the tree. It's, so I'm looking, so as I'm looking as if I'm taking that picture, the air handler is not in yet, but it's about 15 feet farther back. I'd say horizontally about 15 feet um, behind that tree sensor that's where my, that my red arrow was pointing to. Um, and it was installed inside of a closet. It was up low. So it probably went up, I don't know, four or five, four feet or so. I'm going to say about 20 feet away. And, and so you can see the... Um, um, it's about, I'm going to say about five feet away, four or five feet away from that supply trunk on the le to the left of that tree. And that supply trunk is just after it transitions from the duct board. So it's a few feet away from that supply trunk. That, it's, it went to round for the back half of the house. Okay. Sticking with the uh, the Ladies Island, South Carolina project, you I saw on one of your slides you talked about a 20, 21 percent savings. Yeah. Um, is that just for that project, or does that apply to more scenarios? Well, so that's oh, that that is just for this project. And again, um, again, this is the house where we we buried half the duct and did not bury the other half. So the other half. It's not buried. It's up in the attic above the ceiling insulation. So the 21% estimate is based on if all the ducts were buried the same as the front of the house. So in that 21%, uh, that was with R30 ceiling insulation mounted above the duct, a little more than required for deeply buried duct by code for, by 2018 requirements. Um, and again, I, I mentioned that I adjusted that to 20 because we had uh, – a little bit more um, um, duct leakage for the final measurement. That was resealed, but, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Well, appreciate everybody sticking around with all these wonderful questions that are coming in, um, and we're getting through them here, and I really do appreciate people sending these in. Um, Bobby's got a question, Dave, and I think it may be too early to tell, because we're talking about a code that hasn't been published yet. Um, but he's wanting to know if you've heard of any feedback or pushback from local building officials for this type of application. I haven't heard of any, but I, I would anticipate some. Um, um, I know that, you know, the, so we, we've done a number of buried duck projects, and, you know, we're generally getting uh, – approval to do that beforehand, of course, um, for our projects. So I, I suspect there are, I mean, there are some code officials who don't like flex duct, period. They don't like it anywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, th not that this is necessarily flex duct. This could be duct right. board or, you know, metal. Um, uh, but no, I, I, um, yeah, I anticipate some, but uh, again, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's been through the uh, rigorous, uh, you know the code the code cycle hearings. Um, you know they go through uh, rigorous debate on on all of the uh, proposed code changes, and it's 
you know, they've uh, they've had their opportunity to weigh in. So, um, you know, I suspect there'd be some, but I, I on the other hand, it's uh, it, it's approved. Yeah, I think he was probably referring more to in the field. Um, to certain, yeah, you're right. The the code hearings provide that opportunity to speak on that. Um, and, and I'm glad you mentioned that it's been used in multiple projects because Anthony's question is: Are there any studies that have looked at a larger data set of installation qualities? I don't have one to reference, even though I, I'm aware of uh, some of the. Again, uh, it's been done for for years in California, and again, that's a dry climate, and they're burying R8 ducts there. Um, but uh, but certainly, there's um, there are evaluations, uh, you know, quality control type evaluations of of buried duct systems there. Um, you know, for for humid climates, uh, I don't I don't know what the database would be, how large that would be for um, you know, for example, for the zero energy ready homes, the uh, encapsulated ducts. Uh, that's again, that's a provision, an optional provision for uh, for that program where ducts are not installed in conditioned space. So, um, yeah, there might be some uh, some data out there, but I don't have a good good answer, or I don't have a report to point you to for that. Gotcha. Uh, Rishali had a question about, is there a baseline duct leakage and insulation level used in the savings estimate that you've got there on screen? Yes. Um, that, that, that energy analysis screen, perhaps? Yeah, um, it could be that, too. Yeah, yeah well, so for, the, for that chart that I had for the energy analysis, my, my baseline house and my first deeply buried duct, uh, I used... Uh, uh, duct leaks of, of, of four, you know, so it was, it was in compliance with current code requirements for duct leakage. Um, you know, then I also had a scenario when I looked at improved ceilings. Yeah, I had actually had a, a couple of those. They go from four to three to two. Uh, I think I used two when I had the uh, deeply buried ducts uh, and the air handler and return inside condition space. So, uh, yeah, the baseline was four, so code, you know, minimum code. Um, and I think some of those are actually, um, um, uh, you know, better duct ceiling. You know, I, I, I think they're conservative. I, I, you know, I, I didn't assume uh, over-the-top duct ceiling for, for that analysis. Gotcha. Uh, Mike had a question about, not me, but a different Mike. Uh, should, uh, shouldn't testing the ducts at rough end be required and not just a recommendation? Well, it's a strong recommendation for me, and I guess the answer is, should it be or are they? I, you know, maybe they should be, but they're not. Uh, the, the, the code allows, um, well, let me put it this way. You know, the only code requirement that requires um, the duct testing is the ducts, buried ducts considered inside condition space. Um, now, now the testing, so so the so the deeply buried ducts and the general requirements don't call for additional or more stringent requirements, um, but they still have to conform to the uh, uh, comply with the existing, which is that. Um, for CFM 25 per 100 square feet, either at rough in or at final, and uh, it, that number can go down to three if the air handler is not installed during a rough in test. Okay. Um, we got a question from Ralph. Uh, when using multiple flex ducts, <clears throat> one inserted inside another. Would there not be potential for condensation to occur at the surface of the enclosed inner barrier slash core area? I'm not sure if he means the the so there, there's there's a, a liner for the inside duct, and there's also a liner for the outside duct. So um, you know those liners are generally. Um, Vapor reductors too. Well, I think that was similar to a previous question. So certainly, there's. I think if they're installed properly, right. 
I think you have potential condensation for for any flex duct or any duct installed in an attic. Um, I think, and I think, and that concentric uh, flex duct option or alternative or method, um, you know, maybe that's not the most practical. It's just a way. We've done it. Um, uh, you know, it's a way to get at least R13 duct insulation. Um, so I think that you know, potentially, let's say if there was a rip in the outer jacket of the outer duct, in that case of the concentric ducts, uh, could moist air get in there and condense on the next surface? Uh, yeah, possibly. Um, on the other hand, um, I think it's unlikely because that duct, that's, that should be your R8 duct on the inside anyway. Um, so you're still protected with a sealed vapor barrier um, and you've got at least R8, well you have R8 insulation between that point and the inner liner of that main duct. Gotcha. Question from James. Um, you had some measurements that were, you know, CFM compared to square foot, and then it was compared to a number, such as 3.4, to the outside for leakage. He's just wanting to know, can this be normalized to be comparable to pre and post readings? I'm not sure I follow that one. Okay, I'll, I'll have, I think James is still on. So James, if you could send in a clarification to your question, I'd appreciate it. I'm gonna move on to Armando's question. Do you have any cost differential between buried ducts in a ventilated attic and just furring down the ceiling and bringing the ducts into constriction space? Well, I, I, I have certainly done a lot of that kind of analysis and I, I, I estimated um, in that energy chart some of the additional costs. So if you look at my red box example and you move um, two columns to the right, I've estimated uh, some cost to um, to do deeply buried ducts. So you, you might, if you can read it, it's kind of small, but if, if you can read it where it says $2,625, well that includes a number of things. That number includes building a mechanical closet down below, so you're taking space from the conditioned area. So that's that's one component of that. Another component, since this example we're in climate zone 2A, I'm increasing my uh, duct insulation on the supply uh, from R8 to R13. So that's another component. That's a larger component uh, of that cost. So I mean, those are probably the two significant costs for, for that. Um, so ducts inside conditioned space uh, that Obviously, that can that can vary. The cost of that, you know, if if you have a two-story house and open web truss, and you can manage to, uh, you know, if you've already got that truss and you can put your ducts inside that floor, um, maybe the incremental cost is not so great. But if you're talking about uh, building, you know, a single-story slab-on-grade house, installing uh, bulkheads to conceal ducts below the ceiling plane, um, and running those all over the house. It can get pretty expensive. I mean, it's not that it's it's simple enough, but it's a lot of linear feet, square feet of of additional wall. There's additional air sealing that's got to be done. Um, so that can get that, that's probably you know, except for building uh, an encapsulated attic, that's probably your second most expensive option. But it, it, that can that varies on the house design, climate. Uh, for example, um, that, that my same red box example. If I go over to Baltimore in climate zone 4A, my incremental cost goes down for the uh, deeply buried ducts because I don't have to um, bump up my duct insulation from R8 to R13. And those are just estimates based on RS means, but we, we do a fair amount of that kind of analysis. So I think it's reasonable, but it's, it's just an example, and that can vary quite a bit depending on the house design and, um, again, what you're comparing the buried duct system to what you're already doing or what you could do. Gotcha. We've got a handful of questions left and then I'm going to wrap it up. So I would ask, um, you know, let's, it's absolutely vital to uh, to hold off on your questions. And, and before we leave, we will show that last slide again so you can reach out to Dave directly. Um, Doug had a question. Do you have any general recommendations for changes you would make for climate zone five where it's obviously colder in the winter? Well, yeah, so these these uh, the duct insulation values um, don't. 
I mean, there these address these requirements address um, you know climate zone four through eight, including five. So, we, you know, um, certainly you know the in the colder climates, you're starting off with a little bit more ceiling insulation. I think R49 at the moment compared to R38 in climate zone three um, and R30 in climate zone one. But um, but no, I don't have any additional recommendations I think if we just if you just simply follow the the code these are minimum so you can you can pile as much insulation on top as you would like uh, if that's if you're talking about uh, you know deeply buried uh, versus buried considered inside condition space um, you know the other buried the first column there that's you know I think if you're certainly if you're modeling for energy savings you want to start at deeply buried uh, and, and go up from there uh, the, the buried column if you recall, you know we don't necessarily need to uh, fully bury those ducts, right? So, so uh, I guess my recommendation would be uh, go with a, at least a deeply buried duct uh, system. And again, these are minimum required values. Uh, you can you can add more insulation, and I don't think there's any increase uh, concern as far as condensation at that point. Um, Edwin had a question. What precautions are recommended when cleaning buried air ducts that are only accessible at the ceiling? Well, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I don't know how uh, different that would be. I mean, I think it's you know it can be challenging cleaning a flex duct in general. So I don't I don't know that the um, I, I mean I don't know that that somebody cleaning ducts is going up to the attic and disconnecting the uh, supply branch at the trunk maybe they are but I, I don't think so I'm not I'm not aware of people doing that so I'm not so sure how how different it would be to tell you the truth uh, I think I think you have the same uh, restrictions that you have with any flex duct or duct board system gotcha um, Bobby had a question that the the ceiling insulation that would be under the duct is that unfaced uh, bat or is that blown in and if it's blown in uh, how would you recommend uh, the duct be supported well that goes back to uh, ducts need to be supported by code so there's there are requirements for duct support intervals um, you know if I'm looking at obviously if I'm running perpendicular um, across the lower truss cord, then it's being supported every two feet, right? Uh, but there are there are straps, you know, for either of these, um, um, you would need to uh, support the duct, whether it's at the ceiling plane or um, or slightly above the ceiling plane with with strapping. That's, there's, there's a picture, uh, and that's what we normally do. I mean, if you look at the middle picture here, uh, that branch run is between the truss cords, and it's being supported by straps, obviously before the ceiling. That middle picture. Gotcha. Same um, kind of trunk. So, so Pete had a question, and I don't, I don't know. You may not know the answer to this, and I don't want to obviously spread misinformation here. But Pete's understanding is that the UL duct listing is going to be voided if any materials are applied to the duct, such as paint or foam insulation. Do you, do you know anything about that, Dave? I'm not aware of that. Okay. All right. I'll look, I'll, we'll, I will look into that, though. We'll leave that one go for now. Um, so, Leslie had another question. Do you have any data that supports the modeled energy saving? I mean, obviously, you have the test house, but I'm, I'm wondering if there's any other modeled energy saving that you may have. Um, modeled or actual? Modeled? Is that the question? Modeled. Yeah, modeled. Yeah, well, I mean, I would. Um, I, you know, we we did modeling for all of these projects. Um, that table, that energy um, estimate table, was um, is is based on modeling using HVAC software in that case. Um, so, uh, um, I guess you know, beyond that, we. I don't have a library of, of, of other projects, but I, all I have I have our own uh, modeling results for this 2009 project, and uh, of course for our South Carolina home. 
Well, speaking of that South Carolina home, uh, the question is, how did the home pass code um, with duct leakage that was over 4 CFM uh, 25 per con or slash condition floor area? <laughs> well, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> the, uh, that is not, that at the time was not uh, um, locally enforced, but we went back, that was that was resealed as well, even though um, to, to the point it was, I, unfortunately, I didn't have a chance to go back and retest that one. Gotcha. Uh, but, uh, but that's one that wasn't being, um, that requirement was not enforced locally at the time. Uh, okay. Good, good question. <laughs> that that sure. explains something, I think. <laughs> um, question I'm, about... I'm, I'm quite confident it would pass now, just for the record. Because okay. uh, I, I, I did the testing at the rough end there, and um, that was one tight duct system. Uh, are there any manufacturers making R13 flex duct that you're aware of? I'm not aware of any that uh, have product available now. Okay. I've heard some are working on it. Okay. Uh, final question. Um, what modeling tool did you use? Well, we used various modeling tools. For the, uh, for the chart that I showed you, the energy chart, um, for that one, I used my Manual J software, and um, so we did the Manual J, and we, the software there uh, uses bin hours to, to calculate the energy, annual energy use for, you know, whatever house we're modeling. So for that one, I use my Manual J software. Uh, we've done, you know, we've done a lot of uh, modeling using the other softwares available, you know, the uh, REM, REM rate, energy gauge, uh, B-opt, uh, but, and I, I find that that's, uh, they end up being pretty close for uh, most conventional houses. So I hope that answers that. Okay. Okay. I, I would like to add one. I don't think I answered one question about. There was a question about testing at rough end stage, and what, I think the question was why is that not required? Um, it's not required, but I think it's a great idea. It's a strong recommendation for me to, um, you know, if you're transitioning to a buried duct system, to to do that. Really, for any duct system, but for to to do that or have your HJC contractor at least uh, do that additional test. Um, and again, you know, that can be. Uh, that could represent another trip out by the rater or tester, but uh, on the other hand, um, you know, if the data is good at roughing, you can uh, that's that can be used for um, you know code compliance. Even though I I really recommend both. I recommend uh, the roughing test because it's easy to fix anything that needs to be fixed, um, and the final uh, test I think is important as well because um, you can measure the you can get the differentiation there between total leakage and leakage to outdoors, and it takes into account the uh, ceiling penetration, ceiling at the ceiling penetrations, not just the register, you know, the register boots and such. Gotcha. Um, all right. Uh, if you want to, uh, Dave, if you want to go to the last slide so people can see how to get a hold of you in case they've got additional questions. Um, sure thing. Let me see here. I want to make sure that I'm responding to people who are still sending some stuff in. Yes, the, just so you guys are aware, um, the video of this is going to be available and, and Green Builder Media is going to send out uh, a link to be able to view this video. Um, and so you'll, you should get that link by the end of the week. So you'll be able to see all these slides again and, and hear the conversation. And maybe you ask a question that we didn't get to while you were still on here. Uh, we did get to your question, believe it or not. So uh, make sure you you tune in all the way to the end. Um, I certainly want to appreciate everybody's time. Uh, Dave, you set a record. This was the, uh, the the longest and the most questions that I certainly have ever gotten on <laughs> any webinar, and I've been hosting these for five years now. And uh, so it, uh, this was this was really cool. I love the interactivity from the from the audience. Uh, really appreciate everybody's time. Dave, certainly appreciate your time on this too. My pleasure. Um, all right. Uh, I certainly want to thank NEMA as well for their generous sponsorship of this record-breaking webinar. So thank you, NEMA. Um, our next webinar is going to be two weeks from today, Wednesday, May 3rd. It's going to be at 2 p.m. Eastern time. We're going to be talking about moisture management fundamentals 
and we're going to have a first-time guest with us. Um, it's actually one of the more popular speakers in the industry today. Joe Stebrick is going to be with us, and that webinar is going to be sponsored by Fortifiber. So until then, get out there and enjoy that planet this weekend with Earth Day. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.